All right. Why'd you do that? All right, let's try it one more time. Here we go. Okay. All right, I think we're finally there. Yay, right? A um, little bit of technical difficulties, right, to keep me, uh, uh, keep me on my toes, I guess. Um, wonderful group today. Uh, got some extra people in our class today from uh, another class. Uh, so it's wonderful to see some new faces, and uh, glad to see you all here. Hope you enjoy the class. Yes, Jimmy. What's that? I didn't. Did you? All right, we'll get him on the way out. We'll get him. It's all right. We'll get him on the way out. Well, he'll tell Jimmy. will tell you all about it. It's all good. Um, but in, in all seriousness, glad you guys are here, and and hope you enjoy the class. Um, we're going to continue our lesson in Proverbs. I'm not sure what you guys were studying in your class before, but we're uh, currently doing a series in the uh, book of Proverbs, kind of taking it verse by verse. Um, and where we left off with was Proverbs 5.20. Um, who'd like to say a prayer for me, though, before we begin here and get everything kicked off? Thank you. Amen. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so a couple quick announcements to make, and then we'll begin with our jokes. As you know, I like to start off with a joke or two. Um, uh, I've been asked um, to uh, permanently head the class, um, and uh, then Jimmy's going to act as uh, basically my alternate going forward. And uh, so I'm very, uh, very kind of uh, uh, Jimmy and Cindy to give me their, their blessings to continue forward with the class, So, um, uh, uh, which I wouldn't have any other way, to be honest with you. Um, you've done this for so long uh, and have been such a steward for these people that uh, I thank you for the, the opportunity to continue in your, uh, in your wake, as they say. Um, I hope I do a good job. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so keep me in your prayers, obviously. Uh, this is uh, something I take very seriously, as, as I, those of you who have seen my classes before have noticed. Um, this is not something I just throw together at the last second. I take it very seriously. I study very, very many hours to be able to do what we do here. Um, and I hope, it, I hope it's helpful. Uh, if it helps one person, it's enough. Um, and, uh, and that's my goal, is somebody comes from here with something they can take home to, to, to their family uh, that will uh, uh, enlighten them or help them in their, their path with God. Um, so let's start off with a couple jokes, as I always do. So one day a, a beggar comes to an old farmhouse, right? And he's, he's starving, right? he's hungry. And uh, he knocked on the door, and uh, he figured, out, I'll knock on this, this farmhouse. Surely they got some food. It's farm. And so an old farmer answered the door, and his wife was right behind him. And, uh, and he said, uh, can I help you? And the man said, well, yeah, I'm, I, I'm hungry, and I hate to bother you, but I'm really hungry. Do you have any food that you could spare? And so the farmer said, well, well, sure, but can I ask you something? Are you a Christian? And the beggar said, well, of course. Can't you tell? He said, just, just look at my, my, uh, my pants here. You, it's, it's obvious, right? And so the farmer looks down at his pants and, and he, sees he's, he sees his knees through the holes in his pants with dirt. So the man's been kneeling some, at, for something, right? And so, so the farmer says, okay. He says, my wife will get you some food, you know, uh, either way, whether you are or not. Um, and uh, so the wife turns around to get him some food and he, he invites him in. As he's coming in, he sees the back of him and he notices something else. Uh, and so he, he asked the beggar, he says, so let me ask you, you know, um, uh, what are those holes in the seat of your pants for, from? What are, how did that occur? And he said, well, those are from backsliding. <laughs> All right. So joke two, <laughs> joke two, just in case, 
Uh, David received a parrot, right, uh, for his birthday. It was a fully grown parrot. The only problem was this parrot, it was a bad parrot. Now, it had a bad attitude. It had, you know how some parrots speak curse words, right? And this is one of them kind of parrots. Every other word out of this parrot's mouth was some kind of expletive, right? And they weren't, you know, things, if, if he wasn't doing that, he was rude, right? He'd tell people, shut up, all that kind of stuff, right? And so David tried very hard to change that bird's attitude. He read the Bible to the bird. You know, he did everything he could to try and get this bird to see uh, that what he was doing was wrong. And nothing worked. He yelled at the bird even. The bird got worse. He shook the bird. The bird got madder and ruder. Finally, in a moment of desperation, David took the bird and put him in the freezer. Well, um, for a few moments, he heard the bird squawking, kicking, screaming, and then suddenly, all was quiet. And he thought, oh no, I've frozen my bird to death. Right? So he opens the door real quick and he looks inside and puts his arm out, you know, because the bird always comes up his arm. Bird comes up his arm real calm and, and, and slowly, right? And uh, the bird says, I'm sorry that I offended you with my language and my actions. I ask for your forgiveness. I will try to check my behavior in the future. David was just astounded at this from this bird. And he was about to ask the bird, so what, what on earth changed you? Was it the cold, you know? And the bird then said, uh, well, can I ask you, what did the turkey do? <laughs> okay, so those are our jokes for the day. <laughs> yeah. I agree with you on the classic, but I take no responsibility for those That's probably a good thing. That's probably a good thing. I have some jokes that are great and some are bad, some bomb, some are awesome. So, you know, hey, it's, it's, it's one of those things. you got to come to the class to figure out, is it a good joke or a bad joke? Then we get to laugh at whether it's a bad joke or not even. Um, so um, as we begin, I kind of want to recap last week's lesson just slightly since the verses that we're going to look at next uh, and learn about is certainly kind of intertwined in, in several ways. So to truly understand our lesson today, we kind of have to, and we have some new people in the class, so it's good uh, in that as well. Uh, it helps us to first look at those to see what, you know, uh, how they are intertwined, right? Um, and last week we discussed the benefits and the virtues that we experience when we're faithful to our husband or wife. We studied Proverbs 5, 15 through 19. Um, those verses explain how we can find a more meaningful, uh, a more long-lasting uh, joy uh, from that relationship uh, of our marriage uh, and that we're not going to later regret it like we might if we uh, strayed from that, right? Um, from indulging what's forbidden. So we also discussed how many commentators uh, of the Jewish faith teach in the Talmud and the Midrash that those particular verses, like we talked about, they interpret them allegorically. And they say that this is not about adultery, this is not about a marriage, this is about a Jewish person should not commit adultery by becoming a Christian. Um, so they turn it into a, uh, a thing about the, the, the difference between the Christian faith and the Jewish faith. Um, and as we learn, these interpretations came many years after Jesus' crucifixion. They replaced the original understanding that the Jewish people had of those verses. Uh, and so there's really no evidence that it's anything more than they tried to shoehorn that in, um, to take it allegorically rather than literally as we, we discussed it. Uh, and it really, as we learned, it was really an ultimately a lesson about folly. Um, uh, and these verses and, and the commentators surmise it to mean that the wife is really pictured, as we remember, as a, a source of water, a well, a fountain. Um, and the man who's tempted to commit adultery should think about how he should feel if his wife were to do the same thing. Um, if your springs were scattered abroad, as it said, right? He should be faithful to her just as he wants her to be faithful to him. Um, so a marriage is a, a two-way street. You both are in the, the journey together is ultimately what the, the primary point of the lesson is. So in our lesson this week, we're going to discuss and hopefully we'll have time to cover each of the four different follies uh, that follow that lesson that we learned last week uh, in 15 through 19. Um, and the warnings are really, they're four snares, distractions, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and, and they're really uh, the only materials in chapter 5 through 7 that deal with, um, uh, that don't deal with, I should say, an immoral woman or uh, sexual immorality, that kind of thing. Um, and this raises the question, so why are these verses located right in the middle here? right, um, of, of talk on both sides of sexual immorality or marriage. And I think a crucial hint to that is the role the immoral woman in chapters 5 and 7 takes. And, and as we remember, it was a personification of uh, sexual sin. She was meant to be a picture 
of sexuality, of sexual sin, right, and of committing adultery, not necessarily just a woman. And it seems moving beyond that personification, what Solomon here is trying to show us is folly is a thing that is going to be in your life. It's part of your life. And it's going to walk into your life at different moments in time. And it's up to us to notice that and notice the end result of that and then shy away from folly, right, to move away from whatever folly brings, whether that be sexual immorality or, as we're going to talk about today, money issues, right? Folly can bring money issues. Folly can bring being lazy or complacent, many different things. So what it's telling us and teaching us is folly comes in many different forms. And folly is to be treated as though it is going to walk into your life and you have to deal with it, just like you would a person. And that's why it personifies the immoral woman, as we discussed last week. And also it's to keep you from looking at this and saying, well, I haven't committed adultery, so none of that applies to me. As we discussed last week, all of that most certainly applies when you're looking at it from the standpoint of how a marriage is structured under God's law. And so even though that particular point of it may not apply to you, the overall message certainly does, especially if you're married. If you're not married, it applies that hopefully when you get married, you recognize those things. We talked about that a husband is to be the servant of the wife and the wife the servant of the husband, just as we are servants of Christ and he was a servant of us. So the picture of marriage is to be the same picture that we have with Christ as a Christian. And that's the lesson that we learned last week. So let's move on to this week's verses and talk about these different follies that it's trying to warn us from. So who can read for me Proverbs 5, 20 through 23 for me, please? And I'll put it on the screen. All right, thank you. For a man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. The evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. The cords of his sin hold him fast. He will die for lack of discipline, led astray by his own great father. Thank you. Um, so, uh, for the man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord. So what this is telling us, it's reminding us of how the righteous, of how the Lord blesses the one who stays on the good path. Um, and it warns us about being led astray uh, to the forbidden path or the forbidden woman. And this can result in being held uh, in sin, held uh, most certainly uh, no different than being held like a person holding it, right? And the, the experience here goes from freedom to bondage, bondage of sin. Um, freedom of choice is one of the privileges that God gives us as Christians. Um, but he instructs us and urges us to use that freedom wisely. Um, that freedom is not meant to be flippant. You know, we're not meant to use that freedom without some action in thought, right? Um, and the laws are really that God gives us are guideposts uh, that he puts in our, our path. Um, and he watches the decisions that we make on that road that we're on. Uh, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding all evil and good, uh, uh, 15.3, uh, Proverbs 15.3. And as long as we use that wisdom uh, or that freedom, I should say, wisely, will mature in our Christian character. Um, and God can trust us with more freedom. He will, um, as we use the freedom he's given us properly. Um, but if we abuse our freedom, if we deliberately uh, disobey God's word, our freedom will gradually become bondage. It won't be freedom anymore. Uh, the kind of bondage that can't be easily broken, right? Um, the evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. The cords of his sin hold him fast. Uh, that's how it's termed in the NIV version, 522. Um, so these words could have been used really as an epitaph for Samson, as we learned a couple weeks ago, right? His life was filled with all of these different um, strays from the Lord. Um, and it's impossible, uh, or actually, no, we didn't learn about that, sorry. Um, but he strayed from the Lord, and ultimately we see that in Judges 13 through 16. Um, but it's impossible to sin without being bound, right? Um, one of the deceitful things about sin is it tries to make you believe it's a freedom, right? Um, that ultimately uh, you are being free when you sin. The truth of it is it only brings slavery. Um, it's a sla You become a slave of sin, uh, as the book tells us here, right? John 8.34 tells that specifically. Um, it says, do you not know that you... that 
do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the ones that you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of, the, or of obedience leading to righteousness. And that's Romans 6.16. So what it's telling us is you become a slave of sin. Um, your world becomes sinful because you can't get out of it, right? And how many times have we, and I know we've all sinned, right? We're all Christians, we're all sinners, all of us. How many times have you had that sin where you, you got started and then it brought you down a path, right? Sins tend to lead to more sins. Um, they don't usually just stop at that first sin. Um, and they tend to lead to more. If it's nothing more than um, regret and, and anger at yourself, that's still a sin. Um, so uh, understand that what it's teaching us here is the cords of sin get stronger the more we sin. Yet sin deceives us into trying to make us believe that that's not the case, that it's freedom. Um, and that we can do and sin however we please. Um, as the, uh, and as the invisible chains that sin puts on us are formed, um, we kind of, we discover at that point the horror of it. Uh, when we can no longer break free from it. Um, when we're bound by it. And that's when we truly wake up, most of us truly wake up and go, hey, where am I, what am I doing? Um, this is not right, right? Um, and so there are millions of people in our world today that are in one kind of bondage or another and they're seeking deliverance. Um, but the only one that can set them free, as we know as Christians, is Jesus Christ. Um, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know we've heard that verse, right? That's a pretty popular one, John 8, 36. So it's no wonder that um, Solomon here, the father here, is warning children, to us effectively, to stay away from the adulterous or sexual sin. Uh, or the most alluring sin, right? And it's not necessarily about, again, about an adulteress. What it's talking about is those sins that are carnal, those sins that are alluring, um, those sins that, those sins that uh, ping at your uh, most vulnerable spot. And for each of us, there's a more vulnerable spot than another, right? Just like a boxer, right? You hit him in a certain spot on the chin, you knock him out. You, I put a certain sin in front of each of you, you're going to probably more be more tempted than another person, right? Because each of us has a particular thing um, that uh, tends to be harder for us to put away, right, as sin. Um, and that's what it's teaching us here, is that, um, uh, you know, ultimately uh, these sins are uh, alluring, but they're deadly. Um, and it says, remove your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Proverbs 5, 8, we learned that. Um, her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. We'll read that in 727. So this is, this is how, you know, basically what he's trying to teach us here. Um, walk away from that sin. Walk away from that forbidden sin. Um, and the chapter ends with a really a motivational section focusing on the reality of God's judgment in verses 21 through 23. Now, although it doesn't specifically uh, specify when or how it will occur, um, uh, and much of the verses argue against adultery, as we've seen over the last week, uh, because the consequences say it's foolish, right? It's, it's uh, not a good thing. Um, and the, the climax of it is uh, ultimately being uh, deceived and disappointed, as we learned, right? Um, so this is telling us it's a crucial part of wisdom um, and our wisdom-affected ethics that we need to follow. Um, Proverbs is not just simply a pragmatic book with theological principles. Um, and verses 21 through 23 kind of hold together that thought. Uh, you have rich teachings here on why we should avoid uh, wrongdoing. Verse 21 teaches us that God both sees and evaluates all our human actions, right? That's straight from theology. Um, even secret sin is not hidden from God, right? He sees it all. He who weighs up, assesses, and ponders it all. Um, every deed, everything we've done, God is the one whom all will give account, as we know, right? Even in the Old Testament uh, wisdom literature, uh, it's, it's a pretty dominant theme there as well. Now, verse 22 focuses on the more common teaching of Proverbs that an individual's actions often have natural consequences as well. Not just consequences from God, but like if you're doing something stupid, it's usually going to end stupidly, right? Um, so that's what that's talking about. It's not necessarily a consequence you get from God. It's a consequence you put on yourself from your uh, sinful action that leads to something a bad consequence. Um, and uh, the wrong actions end up trapping us, you know, in themselves. 
So sin often, with its tantalizing promise of freedom, leads to being captive or tangled uh, by the wrongdoing. And we see a lot of this in our world today, mostly with drugs and alcohol, right? Um, addiction to that. Uh, that's a sin. Um, but Proverbs insists that those who take away that way of folly are addicts to sin, no different than somebody's addict to a, um, a drink or a drug. Um, you could become addicted to sin. And those that are in bondage of sin and are loving sin usually are addicted to it in one way or another. And we've talked about that before, about the wicked person that loves his wickedness, right? Um, the wicked person that loses sleep, uh, as we, we learned a couple weeks ago, um, over not being able to be wicked, right? Um, he's, he's upset because he doesn't have enough time to be wicked because he's got to go to sleep, um, one, of, one of the Proverbs we read. Um, so sin ultimately can lead to an addiction in of itself. Um, and, and that's what this is teaching us. Um, so the final verse kind of brings us back to the issue of character, that the evildoer here has made a, a wrong foundational choice. They're choosing folly rather than wisdom. And that ultimately is the point here. This is, again, folly. Um, this is the, the definition of folly. Um, and the verb, S-G-H, and I can't, I can't pronounce it. I'm sorry. I don't do some, some words I can, some I can't. That one I can't. I don't even know how to start. Um, but that means intoxicated. So people that are trapped in this kind of sin, it's no different than being intoxicated with alcohol or a drug. Um, they get trapped in it because they become, they begin to love it. Um, and that's the, also the danger of sin is as you sin, it leads to more sin, leads to more sin. And at some point you begin to like it. You begin to become intoxicated by it. You push away the Holy Spirit to the point to where you no longer hear God's voice. You only hear sin's voice. And I promise you it's not a voice that you want to keep hearing because it leads where this tells us uh, to, to ultimately your demise. Um, but that is ultimately also the point here. Many people in sin will try and claim how free they are. They are not free by any stretch. They are stuck. And they are so stuck that they want you to join them in their stuck, usually. Um, and so that's why they're telling you how free it is when it's not, and they know it's not. Um, and they go home and cry at night, usually, over their sin. Um, quietly, alone. Um, but they're still upset. There's, it's still bitterness, right? Um, and that's what this is teaching us, these, these verses. So let's move on to our next set of verses. Uh, well, first, discussion question. Why do you think these Proverbs teach us that sin ensnare us, like I'm talking about, or that it holds us fast in the cords of our sin? And how, once you're in that, how do you break free um, from those cords of sin? Any thoughts? I can tell you personally. Um, uh, for me, um, when I found myself in sin um, and, and unable to break free, the only way that I found I could break free was through God's word. Um, I would open the Bible um, and I would, I would ask God to help me see my error, help me to see what I'm doing wrong and how to fix that error. Um, and he answered every time. Um, I've yet to have him answer, or not answer, I should say. Um, but that for me was the only way I could break free um, and keep it from going so far as we're talking about here. Um, and that's one tip I have for you. Open your Bible. It doesn't matter where you open it. Just open it and ask God to help you and look through it. Um, uh, pray. That would be another option. Any other thoughts? Yes. Yeah. Um, exactly. And, and God will answer that prayer for strength. He'll, he'll give you the strength you're asking for. But a lot of times, you know, we get wrapped up in ourselves and we think, I don't need his help. I got this. I'll fight this sin myself. And yet what it taught us last week in these sins is run away. This kind of sin, you don't want to face. You don't want to try and fight alone. You run away. Yeah. Um, God examines your heart. Yes. And he's really the only one who changes your heart. Yes. And sometimes I have to pray that you know, he would mold my heart. Absolutely right. Um, that's kind of how I try to do it. You know, we're all human. 
Yes. 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 And those thoughts sometimes lead to action. Those actions sometimes leads to more action. And so even the thought we have to, to flee from. Um, and that's exactly right. Um, as, uh, again, we, we tend to think we can do it on our own. But just like you said, we can. Um, even our salvation was not of us. It was of God, right? Um, we didn't save ourselves. He saved us. Um, so all of it takes his doing, not our own. And so if you know that your salvation came from God, remember that each time you're, you're wondering, do I need God's help? Yes. The simple answer is yes for everything. <laughs> everything. And if you're not asking for God's help, boy, are you leaving out an advocate that I got. Because God helps me with everything. Everything. And I promise you, my day now is a whole lot better than it used to be. When God wasn't helping me, oh, it was bad. It was very bad. Uh, my days were bad. Uh, my health was bad. My life was bad. Everything was bad. But now, it's not. But I have God in my corner, right? Um, and what kind of cut man do you want? I want God in my corner. I want Him, with, I want him fighting with me. Fighting for me, right? Um, all right. Good discussion. Let's move on. Who can read for me? Uh, and so we're going to move on to the follies now, some of these follies. Who can read for me uh, Proverbs 6, 1 through 5? So we're away from all the, uh, the, the talk about sexual sin and adultery and all that for now. We'll read this one. All right. Thank you. My son. For a stranger, if you are snared in the words of your mouth, caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, and save yourself. For you have come into the hand of your neighbor. Go, hasten and plead urgently with your neighbor. Give your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber. Save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowl. Thank you. Um, all right, so as we mentioned, these next few verses are, are really a series of follies um, that we're being taught about at, that we uh, are dangers, really, um, that we as Christians might become entangled in um, and how we should go about handling those, how we can keep ourselves from being entangled in those cords of sin that go with these different follies, right? Um, so I think it's been, you know, it's been, what, three weeks now since we first defined what folly is from a Christian standpoint. So I think it's probably mm -hmm. helpful if we do that again real quick, um, uh, just even a refresher or for, for those that may not have been here. Um, in Christianity and the Bible, folly refers to a lack of wisdom, a lack of good judgment or understanding, and particularly in moral and spiritual matters. So it's not just foolishness. It's not just being stupid. It's not ignorance, but a deliberate Ignorance, a deliberate turning away from God and his ways. Um, and the Bible uses several Hebrew and Greek words to convey this concept, um, each with slightly different nuances to what it means. Um, and therefore, there are different facets of folly, uh, different faces, if you will, um, of folly that we should consider. And one of those, nabla, the Hebrew word signifies moral foolishness or perversity and wickedness. It's used often to describe those who reject God's teachings. Um, and live in defiance of God's will. We see that in Proverbs 1.7 and Psalm 14.1. The word kessel um, for folly, this term emphasizes mental dullness or a lack of insight and poor decision making. Um, it describes those who are easily deceived or led astray by your own desires, right? Um, or by the influence of others. We've talked about that several times in different lessons the last few weeks. Um, moros in Greek, this word encompasses the foolishness uh, both foolishness and also foolishness with a moral dimension to it. Um, it can refer to someone who's ethically blind, um, unable to discern right from wrong. Somebody that's just, they're willfully blunt, right? Um, and don't have any idea what, what they're doing wrong, right? Um, so folly has several uh, definitions here, different, different facets to it, um, and several consequences in the Bible it teaches us over the last few weeks we've seen. Um, but probably the biggest one um, that we've seen so far is it leads to separation from God. Um, when we pursue foolish choices, we distance ourselves uh, from God's blessing and his guidance. Um, destruction, hardship, folly often leads to poor decisions with negative consequences. It brings suffering and hardship on you uh, and others. 
uh, spiritual blindness is another thing that folly leads to. A life of folly hardens your heart. Uh, it, it blinds you to God's truth, to God's grace. Uh, and Proverbs in the Bible offers hope, though. It tells us there is redemption from folly uh, through repentance, through faith in God, uh, and a, a commitment to God's wisdom. And through that, we can turn away from foolish choices and actually embrace God's word, uh, guided by the Bible, of course, right? And we see that in several uh, verses of Proverbs, as well as James 1.5 uh, talks about that. So some key takeaways before uh, we continue on uh, of, you know, looking at this proverb of what to avoid. Um, folly is not just a, a, a lack of intelligence, but it's a deliberate departure uh, from God's wisdom. And it has serious consequences. So uh, that's why these verses about folly are so important. Um, so the first thing that he's talking about here, let's examine what we just read. Um, the first snare that he's talking about is a financial matter. It's a, a, a financial matter with your neighbor and a stranger, as it says. Um, and we may not have time for the other follies today because we got started late, but we'll at least hopefully get through this one. Um, and we'll read the others probably next week. But the first proverb here is a monetary discourse with a lecture kind of to it, right? And it addresses the sun here as uh, in other lectures, but uh, it doesn't have the typical introductory call to attention that we've been seeing, right? It uses a particular Hebrew term uh, in its structure here, which gives us an idea of its intended message. And the structure is what we call an imperative extending a conditional. And I know that's, that sounds like who needs to know that, but what it does is it's telling us that we should, if we find ourselves in this position, here's what we should do. So it's telling us this is a solution for this problem as a Christian. Um, so before we, uh, uh, well, actually several procedures, just to tell you real quickly what a surety, what it's talking about here, a surety is, um, so that you understand what they're, what it's warning us against, right? Um, they're talking about uh, what we today might call a cosigner on a loan, right? Um, and back then, there were several ways for securing loans in ancient Israel. A borrower uh, could deposit an item of value as collateral uh, for his loan. And we see that in Deuteronomy, Exodus, etc. He could pledge his house. He could pledge his land, his fields. Uh, Nehemiah 5.3 talks about that, or his children even. Um, and there's several places that we see that. Alternatively, uh, a borrower back then could have a loan guaranteed by somebody else. And that's what this is talking about. We still do that today, obviously, right? It's cosigner, right? You might uh, have somebody say, well, will you co-sign this loan for me for this car? That's what this is referring to. Um, and back then, you know, of course, uh, it worked the same way. Um, if the person that um, was supposed to pay the loan didn't, it fell on the, the cosigner, the person that had given surety or security for the loan. Um, and what this proverb is trying to tell us is, uh, you know, be careful when you're in that position. Uh, as a matter of fact, it uses some specific terms here um, that tell us how risky th this is and how uh, it should be something we should be very careful about doing. Um, uh, basically, you know, it's not saying never help your, your fellow brother, your fellow sister, but when you read this, it's talking about uh, a stranger. Um, when it says you're giving surety for a stranger. And what this isn't, it's not necessarily meaning the Greek word it uses doesn't mean necessarily like a stranger you've never met. It means somebody that you don't know well, right? Um, so they may be somebody you know, but not really well. So you're making a guess, truly, whether they can pay the loan back because you don't know them that well. You met them, but you don't know their life. You don't know, is this a person that um, keeps their word? Is this a person that doesn't keep their word? Is this a person that I've seen pay off loans in the past or not pay off loans in the past? So it's, it's this kind of arrangement where you've got somebody that you're not really uh, knowledgeable about and you're now becoming surety for them. You're becoming security surety, however you want to term it, for them. Um, and it's telling us when we do that, be very careful um, because then you are putting yourself at risk. Uh, you're no longer, uh, and you should treat it as though you're the one with the loan. Um, because ultimately you probably are. Um, you're making a, uh, a security for somebody you don't know. You're more than likely going to find that you're going to end up paying it. And it also is telling us to be careful that uh, uh, because of the moral obligation to do this, uh, we have to be careful we don't give a pledge we can't handle. 
right? So if you're going to be surety for somebody, if you're going to co-sign a loan for somebody, it's telling us, make sure it's a loan you can pay. If it's not something you can today take on, you should not be doing it. Um, as much as you want to be kind and, and help somebody, you're no longer being helpful in the right way at that point. You're being, you're being, it's folly. You're not doing it, looking at it with the potential consequence of where it might lead. Um, and you're doing it without a lot of forethought. That's folly. Um, that's doing anything that you're doing without thinking about it clearly um, and the consequences of it and where it might lead. And guess what? If you put yourself in a very bad position financially, that leads to sin, doesn't it? Every time I've been in a, a position where I'm broke, it usually has led to sin one way or another, right? Either I'm scared and afraid that God's not going to provide for me, which is a sin, or I then, you know, perhaps uh, uh, don't do something I should do, right? Um, and that's a sin, right? Or maybe I, I lower my ties that month, and that's a sin. Um, but do you understand what I'm saying? So ultimately what it's teaching us here is make sure it's not something that you're going to end up having to, to sin uh, because that person didn't pay off their loan. Um, so be careful of that folly. Um, and there are several places in Proverbs, the Bible, etc., that tell us that we should be kind to our neighbor, we should help uh, other people, all of that. But again, it says do it with a clear mind, do it with a clear head. Know what you're signing, who you're signing for. Know them a little bit more than just I know them, right? Um, and, and make sure it's something you can take on yourself should the floor fall through, right? We don't really have time, I don't think, to move on to the next one, but let's do some discussion here. Um, about this. What are your thoughts or, or any thoughts of any time you've ever been in this situation where somebody has um, asked you to be a co-signer for them? Um, how did you handle it? What did you say? What did you do? Any thoughts? No? Um, I've been the co-signee. I've been the guy asking, if that helps. Um, uh, and I've tried not to, when I have, I've tried not to actually do it in the first place. Um, and, uh, and I've tried to make sure that I always pay it, right? I'm not going to let it land on that person that co-signed for me. Um, because then that would be sinful of me. Um, I then asked them to do something and, and vouch for me effectively and speak for me effectively. Uh, and then I am betraying their trust. Um, so... I've tried to be whenever, I've never had a situation where I've asked somebody to co-sign for me that I didn't pay it back myself. But um, I've never been on the opposite side. Um, uh, well, no, I take that back. Years ago, uh, before I was a Christian, I did have one, one instance of it. And they didn't pay it. <laughs> so, um, and I ended up, uh, uh, it was a small car. But anyway, um, point is, is, is all of this is teaching us be careful in those situations. Yes? Yes. At that, I'm glad you mentioned that because at that point, aren't you? At that point, you are financing sin, right? Yeah. So you're then becoming party to sin, which is why it says, "Don't do this in a folly way where you don't know that person." Like you're saying, it's somebody you got to know them. You got to know: is this a person that is in this position because of sin? Or because of, you know, lack of, like you said, lack of uh, uh, being good with finances, which is sinful. Um, and, uh, and how did they get in that position? Was it drugs? Was it alcohol? Was it poor decision making? Was it betting on the horses? You know, um, what was it? And if you don't know that, then you're making a decision to be surety for somebody. And it's probably going to bite you um, more than likely um, bite you back. So good, good discussion. Yes. Yes. 
probably will never come back together. Yes. And then and you've lost a person to witness to. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And that's sad because that is could be a long term friendship. I've seen long term friendships get destroyed. I've seen families, guys, get destroyed over this exact thing. This. Yes. Over the years, whenever we've had somebody approach us with something of this nature, we have just come to the decision that either we're going to give it to them as a gift yes. or we're not going to give it to them at all. Yes. Because if, if you hang it out there as a loan or it doesn't, it's like Jimmy just said, your friendship is down the drain. Exactly. So if you go into it with the mindset that this is not a loan, this is just a gift we're giving you, and if you want to pay us back, that's fine. That's right. That's a loan cake. Right. Right. And yeah, and if you can, and that's the point here too of that is it's something you can handle then, right? You know you can because you gave it as a gift. That's exactly a great way of handling it. Yes. In that same regard, you've got to be careful not to be facilitated that happens. Exactly. Right. Sometimes it's not the appropriate thing to do. Exactly. Sometimes that help is not help. Yes, Jim. Sometimes you have to put the brakes on. Yes. Yes. And if you feel your support to sin and sin in yourself at that point, yes. that's a no no. Yeah, you don't do it. But you have a right to know. Some people say, well, you know, that's my business. <laughs> no, you just made it possible. Exactly. Exactly. If it were your business, we would be having this conversation. Yeah. 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 Exactly right, Jimmy. Yes, Greg. Sure, they may be lying. Well, not even lying, but if they're, you know, always in a situation where they're always sure. falling short because sure. of this, even if it's for the cause, those are things that you need to look at because always falling short is a problem. Right. Well, you know, there are some people in the world that are victims, and they're always victims. That's right. And the world is out to get them, and it's always out to get them, and it's always the world's fault. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if, you, if it's that kind of person, it's probably you need to be very careful. Yes. Well, I mean, you, you take, for instance, the, the man that stops on it for the credit flight. You don't know if he's going to use that money for drugs and alcohol. Sure. You know, so, so you become part of his sin. Sure. Because yeah. you're feeding, you're, you're feeding his sin. I right. mean, you know, just because he tells you, hey, you know, I'm stuck here and, you know, why are you stuck? Just like Jimmy said, you need, you need some information here. Sure. Well, you're also, as Christians, we're stewards. It's not our money in the first place. We're stewards of God's money at that point. And so to be a true steward of God's money, yes, you need to be careful how you spend it and where it goes. Because exactly what you're saying, if you're unsure of what it's going to be used for, you become part of that whatever it's used for. Exactly right. Did somebody over here say, I thought I heard somebody say something over here. Did I have a comment? No? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure. Yeah. 
Sure. Right. Sure. Right. Sure. Right. Right. You bet. You bet. Yeah. And that's and that's good ways of because uh, again we're called to be um, uh, charitable. We're called to be kind to our neighbor. We're called as Christians. This is our duty. It's not just something we should do. It's not just something that's a good idea. It's a duty. Um, this is how we are to be with our fellow man. But again, we've got to be good stewards of God's money. We've got to do it in the right way. Um, and if you're doing it in the wrong way, you're not helping God in anything. Um, or are you helping that person in anything? Truly. Yes. And I'm glad you were able to help somebody that truly needed it. That's and that's ultimately what we again, what we as Christians should do. Um, we're going to end it here. We got like three minutes till the the bell, so I think that's perfect timing for us to do a prayer and end. I do want to um, show everybody at the last slide here. Um, I do have a, a QR code. If you want to take a picture of it, it will take you to the uh, YouTube channel that I have for all of these videos. For each week, we video this. Um, and so if you've missed any of the lessons, you can go back and look at it um, uh, or any future lessons or whatever. Um, so if you want to take a photo of this, that'll get you there. Um, and uh, I try to get it up no later than Monday. I usually get it done tonight, but I don't get home from Awanas till like 8 o'clock. And then I do this. So some nights I'm too tired, to be honest with you, or in too much pain. So I'll wait till Monday. But at the latest, it goes up Monday, okay, and Monday morning. Um, all right. Uh, who would like to say a prayer for me and we'll end our class? Got it? Thank you. Amen. Thank you, guys. See you all next week. Have a great rest of your Sunday and a great week. God bless. Thank you, bud. Thank you. Glad you did. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes. Go back to the person that gave the loan and say, and say, look, I'm, I shouldn't have done this. Um, I, I, I took uh, this man's security in error. I don't know him well enough. Uh, please forgive me for that. Let me out of this. Uh, you know, and, and hopefully he'll, you know, he'll take care of the thing himself. You know, right? Don't wait. Now, if you can pay it yourself, pay it yourself, yeah. and then let that that borrower pay you back, like the, like some people made that suggestion, yeah. give it as a yeah. gift. But if you can't, then you need to go to the original loan, what it's saying, yeah. the original humble loan, yourself. and humble yourself and ask for him to let you out. Bye, honey. Right, don't wait. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, man. Yeah. God bless.